of Mr. 96's Pop Reviews, my name is Mr. 96. We as a people love to sensationalize the worst or the best of what a year had to offer, but if I had to tell the truth, a majority of the songs we hear are just okay. We remember the really good and really bad because they left an impact. But if I randomly asked you right now to name every major hit from, say, 2017, you wouldn't name half of them because they've already been forgotten. Sure, you can point out great years like 2004 or 2012 and bad years like the early 90s or 2016, but if we look at music as a whole, most of it just averages out to be, well, average. Not good, not bad, just in one ear and out the other. And since average is not often talked about, I think it's up to me to look back at the songs most people probably left behind in 2018. Since we're looking at average songs that were insanely popular, I'm limiting this list to Billboard's Year in Hot 100 for 2018. Also, the song cannot be released past August of 2018, but if it was released before September of 2017, the song cannot be a part of the 2017 Year in Hot 100. Just so you know, I'm not ranking these songs by best or worst. I'm looking to see which song most epitomizes the label of 5 out of 10. Mr. 69's on piano, now let's give one last tribute before we inevitably forget the top 5 most average hit songs of 2018. A few weeks ago, I went to see Aquaman, and the end credits had this one Skylar Grey song I thought was really good, so that got me thinking a lot about movie soundtracks. For the record, I'm not talking about the orchestral score that plays during the movie. I'm only talking about the individual pop tracks recorded for mass consumption. One thing I've learned over the years is that soundtracks and movie quality have zero correlation. For example, the Mortal Kombat theme is goddamn legendary, even though the movie is an overall meh. And like I said, the score and soundtrack are two different things. Black Panther had a great score, but the soundtrack left a lot to be desired. It's really strange, since this song in particular includes two artists I highly respect, but for some reason, all the stars didn't leave that much of an imprint on me. On the surface, this seems like a song I'd totally buy, but emotionally, something about this just doesn't move me. Is it Kendrick? Tell me what you gonna do to me. Confrontation ain't nothing new to me. Well, it's not the strongest performance of his, but I don't have a problem with him being low-key. He was low-key in love, and that song was goddamn fantastic. On the other side, I don't think the problem is SZA either. I mean, sure, all she does is mostly repeat one line throughout the chorus, but I like plenty of songs that do the same thing, so I can't really say it's her performance. The only answer I can come up with is... Wait, I think I just found the issue. Play that chorus again and listen closely to the drum beat. Right there. You hear that beat that goes It's just one simple sequence played on loop throughout the entire song. I'm not kidding, just listen to the verses. It sounds the exact same in both the verses and the chorus. Sure, the music around it swells up when the chorus comes on, but when the beat itself stays the same without any kind of progression, it just becomes stale and wears out its welcome. Also, the production on it just sounds kind of cheap, especially on a soundtrack song for a big budget movie. All the stars could have easily been a passable tune, but two alright performances aren't enough to justify the production, and the entire thing offsets to become an overall eh. When I first heard this song, I thought it was absolutely terrible. But over time, I realized it had more to do with my burnout from the artist instead of the song itself. Upon reevaluation, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. It wasn't the best either. Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Say you never ever leave. Like I've said one too many times on this channel, I am absolutely sick of Drake. And back when this hit number one, I just couldn't take it anymore. It was a miserable summer. But then I heard it again towards the end of the year and thought, this ain't too bad. Specifically, I thought the part with City Girls was alright. It's at least a change of pace, but the reason I initially hated this song so much was not just Drake sounding disinterested, that's kind of a given, but the timing of his laziness. Remember, this single came after the Scorpion album bomb, so having to hear Drake go through the motions at number one for an additional two months was brutal. It's basically like the Boo saga in Dragon Ball Z. By the time we reached Kid Boo, the arc had dragged on for too many goddamn episodes and we just want it to end already. Is In My Feelings terrible? No, it's practically harmless. 
but it was the symbolic victory lap for a dull, overstuffed album. I heard enough Drake in 2018, and so did you. So I think it's best that we treat this song like the filler it is and move on. I mean, what else can I say to get the idea across? This song basically inspired me to make this list. Post Malone is a singer who, like this song, mostly just exists to exist. And yes, I'm calling him a singer because I have zero idea why anyone would call him a rapper, which he isn't. Basically, the dude is here to fill in space on the radio since he's the only hip-hop sounding act that has any semblance of crossover appeal. But hey, that's much better than his garbage first impression a few years ago. And I'm like, Whoa. But on the topic of mediocre songs, this song manages to be pretty steady at that job. It never goes up, but it never goes down. It's like the definition of music filler, which is honestly surprising considering it possibly has the world's most misleading title ever. This song is psycho in the same way Madonna is like a virgin. And if it couldn't get any more middling, Post decided to bring in a guest artist with a similar vocal range as his. Ty Dolla Sign is the feature vocalist you get to maintain the status quo. He definitely won't ruin your song, but he ain't exactly blowing the top off either. Like really, does anyone seriously remember his guest verse from Work From Home? No, you don't. And if you're waiting for him to add an extra dimension to Psycho, then all I can say is keep on waiting. We gon' get high, we gon' hit Rodeo. I mean, sure, he's more vocally skilled than Post Malone, but he's not singing anything with lyrical complexity or sonic contrast. Ty's voice sounds nearly the same as the main artist, so his part ends up making the song sound a bit more redundant. Unlike with my worst or best hits, I'm not gonna spend too much time on songs that left no emotional impact. So as far as I'm concerned, I've given Psycho more attention than it probably deserves. Song acknowledged, let's move on. It's crazy to me when people assume I hate hip hop because I include some rap songs in my worst list. But if I'm being honest, it's really just a numbers game. Most of the Hot 100 was rap music anyway, so it's not a surprise that a decent number of rap songs were going to appear in my top 10 worst. It's just a matter of expected value. If you really want a genre I'm biased against, that would be country music. Okay, let's clarify something. While I'm not a fan of country, it's not because I think every song is super terrible. Sure, there's always a few stinkers in there, but the reason I openly dislike the genre is not the lows it reaches, but just the lack of highs. Honestly, if you ask me to name some country songs I love, I don't think I can name you more than the number of fingers on my hand. But even with that, I didn't put any country in my top 10 worst list, since country honestly had a pretty good year. Yeah, I have to admit there were some songs I didn't mind hearing in 2018. A few of you asked why I didn't mention Marry Me by Thomas Redd in my best list, but even if I did, it probably would have been at best an honorable mention because it's just not something that sticks with me. From a macro perspective, country will never be nostalgic or relatable to me like it is to you. I live in Silicon Valley. Not only did I not grow up with country music, I don't think I've met a person here who listens to it. And let's be real, trying to convince me to love country is like me trying to convince Mark from Spectrum Pulse to love K-pop. I can try, but chances are it's probably not gonna happen. So to properly explain how country doesn't hit home for me, let me demonstrate to you the average country song. Mercy. I really don't know what else I can say to describe this. It's not terrible, it doesn't offend me to my core, but it doesn't hook me in or leave me wanting more. I don't know the artist, I don't know the song, and I don't have any interest to delve any further. So if you're gonna break my heart, just break it. Okay, I guess the guy sounds a bit melodramatic, but at the same time, he's smart enough to end this bad relationship, so I can't exactly say he's immature either, especially when we have another Mercy that's 800 times more whiny. And really, this is sort of how most country music just sounds to me. It's not brain-rottingly awful, but there isn't an aesthetic or hook that keeps me coming back. Sure, I complain a lot about terrible rap songs, but the reason I do so is because I know rap at its greatest is freaking fantastic. Even when I want to love country, something about it just keeps me from going all the way. I don't know whether this song is loved or hated by my fellow critic contemporaries, but this song to me is country in a nutshell. Enough merits to understand the appeal, but not much room for growth under a low ceiling. But seriously, to all my fellow critics who love country, I'd really like to know if this song is good or bad, because all I feel is the same feeling I had before I heard it. Mild indifference. 
have mercy. When I made this list, there was only one song that was going to top this. Like I said before, a majority of music falls in the average category, like a normal distribution. So it seems fitting that the most average hit song of 2018 would be its biggest hit. God's plan. God's plan. Like you, I thought I was done with Drake, but nope. We couldn't cap off this year without acknowledging the most significant export Canada had to offer. Now much has changed since I heard this early last year. If any song fits the definition of merely existing, look no further as this song possesses all the qualities of mediocrity. What do you think of God's plan? It exists. What do you think about Drake's message? It exists. How have your feelings toward it evolved? They haven't. Hell, even Psycho had some fluctuation in opinion, but God's plan has been a flat line since the day it was released. Really, there's only one line that's even worth taking a glance at. She said, do you love me? I tell her only partly. I only love my bed and my mom. Wow, I didn't think you could make a G-rated explanation for being a deadbeat. But to be fair, Drake's not really a fan of parental guidance. And on top of that, it's not like the revelation of his son changed the tone of the song. The entire thing is so bland, he had to pay the city of Miami to justify a music video. What is God's plan? Who cares? It's just empty words meant to brag about how awesome he is. And you know what? We don't need to hear it anymore. You've already pushed that message in excruciating detail. If you're just gonna bombard us with middle-of-the-road content, just take a break. You're one of the most popular people in the world. You can make money for the next five years without music. So if you want people to take your music seriously, take the next year off and come back when you decide to give a damn. I'm Mr. 96 and thank you for watching. Like this video if you want me to make this list an annual thing and make sure to subscribe to see more. Let's get to 3000, shall we? Next up will be my first song review of the year. And unlike the songs in this video, this next song should at least have some exotic flavor. Pop songs may come in numbers, but there's only one. 96. <laughs>